Welcome to BGRLearning.com, and I'm your host, Larry Solomon. And this is the second part in a series that I'm doing um, on uh, domestic discipline. And in this series, I've done a previous series where I talked about how to implement domestic discipline and how wives can receive that. And that was based, um, I had first laid the basis, the biblical basis and the historical basis for domestic discipline in my writings on my blog, biblicalgenerals.com. But now I'm going back and I am doing in podcast format, bringing what I said in those writings and even more things that are not included necessarily on my um, blog um, into this new podcast series, which will lay first the biblical, which I already did in the first part that you need to listen to, um, the biblical basis for domestic discipline, and then following that up with the historical precedents for domestic discipline, and as well as the debates about um, domestic discipline that occurred you know, almost 2000 years ago with the early church fathers, what we're going to talk about here in this podcast. But if you have not listened to the first podcast, I would highly recommend that you go back um, and listen, look up a podcast, um, the biblical case for domestic discipline that comes right before this one. And um, listen to the biblical case. You need to have that biblical foundation for, for why uh, this is a right and a duty of a husband. And also I explain that domestic discipline, although today it is almost exclusively associated with spanking, wife spanking, um, that it doesn't always have to be physical, that men can discipline their wives in physical or non-physical ways. And that some men may only be able to non-physically discipline their wives. Um, so, and I explain that more in my guide to men implementing um, uh physical discipline, domestic discipline, um, in their marriages. <laughs> so again, sometimes we can kind of like act like they're one in the same domestic discipline, wife spanking, but it, domestic discipline encompasses wife spanking, but it, it really, it, it, it's all of the discipline of a wife. Okay. By her husband. <laughs> so with that being said, so in this podcast, we're going to be, um, zooming in on two great church fathers, uh, John Chrysostom. And I hope I'm saying that right. And Augustine. Okay. And John Christentum uh, lived from 347 to 407 AD. Augustine lived from 354 to 430 AD. Um, John Christentum was in the Eastern Church, um, in, in the Byzantine Church. Okay. And um, his writing and his views um, reflect that culture. Um, and and uh, Augustine was uh, from. Uh, Hippo Regis in Numidia in Roman North Africa. So his um, views are definitely affected by the Roman cultural views of family and how things should operate. And these men had very different views of, of wife discipline as we're going to get into in this podcast. But I just want to say that um, uh, uh, we need to realize as Christians, and now I, I realize that this will be offensive to some of my Christian and Orthodox brothers, and I do not mean to needlessly offend you, but um, John Christendom and Augustine were not infallible in their um, understanding of the scriptures, their interpretation of the scriptures. Um, they were not infallible. Only the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself were infallible in their understanding of the scriptures and their speaking the very word of God. Okay. Um, these men were not infallible. All right. Uh, we need to realize that they were very much affected uh, by their culture. And, and again, I want to go back to the apostles and prophets. Those men were not sin, sinless and infallible either. But God, especially supernaturally, the scriptures say that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, so th they were they were supernaturally inspired and kept on track. And God kept out the cultural things that were in contradiction with the Bible. Now, if something culturally was not in contradiction with the Bible, if it was allowable under God's moral system, then they could bring that in. But anything from their cultures that was not, did not match up with a biblical worldview, that did not match up with God's worldview, okay, which is what the Bible represents, um, the apostles were providentially kept, supernaturally kept from bringing that into the scriptures. We cannot say the same thing for John Chrysostom or Augustine. And, and, and it's, it's proven easily by the fact that these men sometimes wrote some things that were very much in conflict with the other. Okay. As we will show here today in this podcast. Um, so we know and, and the, where the Bible never contradicts the Bible, no, no book of the Bible, even though a lot of 
liberal scholars or, or atheists or secularists try and make the Bible contradict itself, different writers that pit them against each other, there is no contradiction. There's no contradiction between Paul or Peter or between Paul and Luke or Paul and Matthew. There are no contradictions or even between Paul and Moses. There are no contradictions in the scriptures, okay? But there are contradictions sometimes between church fathers, okay? Um, so with that being said, that these men were fallible in their understanding that I look at John Christotum and Augustine as men that I respect. Uh, but I look at them just like John MacArthur today um, or, or John Piper or um, Martin Luther or John Calvin, John Knox, uh, Wesley. I look at these men on the same lines as those men that, that they were all good men, Spurgeon, uh, greatly admire these men, but that doesn't mean they are infallible in their interpretation and application and understanding of the scriptures. So what I want to do here is present some of the things that these two men said, and then I'm going to apply um, some of the things that we talked about in the first podcast and the, and the biblical basis um, for domestic discipline, as well as some things we may not have really emphasized, but will be necessary to show which one of these men we're actually right. And again, I don't want to say, because you know where I'm going to come down based on the first podcast, that I do not think wife beating or, 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 or corporal discipline of a wife is, is necessarily wrong. But it's not always right either. It can be done wrong. It can be done in a wrong way. It can be done outside the limits of what God places on physical discipline. Okay. But um, as I apply this, you, you, you're going to see where, where we see that really Augustine's view comes much closer to what the scriptures show, the patriarchal view of the family um, versus John Chrysostom's, you know, really, really, John Chrysostom's views are extremely, as I was studying him, extremely similar to modern complementarianism. I mean, you could literally, because because John Chrysostom did believe in male headship, in, in biblical, that the husband is the head of the wife and the that, that she used to submit to him. He wrote that extensively, okay? But he did not believe in the mastery of the husband over his wife, like Augustine did, okay? So so just like complementarians today, or the lordship, really, the lordship of the husband from 1 Peter 3, 5 to 6, where the Bible um, exhorts women to follow Sarah's example in, in calling their husbands lord, okay? Um, Augustine quoted that, okay? Augustine... Augustine believed that where, where, where John Chrysostom, um, like modern complementarians, he kind of left that part off. Like basically, yeah, husbands are the head of their wives. He would say that John Chrysostom would say that. Yep. Husbands are the head of their wives, but they're the head, but they're not the Lord. They're not the master. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, and even in one translation that I'll read here today, and I think it's right. I mean, he literally calls the husband and wife partners, and and it's like the Bible never calls husband and wife partners. It calls them companions, not partners. <laughs> um, maybe that translation's not right, but that's that's what it says um, in the translation that I read. So while I do list a few different sources here as I'm going through, I just one of the prime sources. It was it was a really good source for me. Um, was this? Uh, uh, it's a study actually called um, "Wife Beating and Manliness in Late Antiquity," and it was done by a female college professor, a historian, um, a history professor, Leslie uh, Dossie, I want to say, uh, uh, was her name, and it was in 2008. Now, those of you who um, uh, follow my blog and, and my podcast and Instagram will know, like, well, that's kind of rich, Larry. A woman? You're taking a book written by a woman? Well, guess what? God uses all kinds of people. God used the donkey to speak in the Bible. So the thing is, is that, is that, um, uh, while I do not agree with this woman's philosophy of life, and I don't agree with her careerism and all of that, um, I have quoted from other books from women in the past. This is not the first time I've quoted from some suffrage books written by women that had really good history in them. And, it, and, and you know, if the history is accurate and, you know, there's a lot of um, quotes, not all of them, but there's many quotes I've seen in this study from her that I was able to verify with other sources that I had read actually read before I read her study. Um, so I know that it's, it's, it's reliable and, and she does a really good job of, of footnoting everything where she got from in excruciating detail. And she even gives additional, 
uh, quotes, fuller quotes in her in her references. So I think it is a, a historically accurate book. Again, I'm always willing to be corrected when it comes to history. Well, Larry, did you know they said this or this wasn't accurate? I, again, uh, I'm just going by the best information that I have right now. Um, and she did a lot of the legwork here. So, I mean, instead of me spending months trying to research all this, might as well, if somebody's already done the work, you know, let them do it. I will quote from some other sources where I knew there were some fuller quotes that she didn't give <coughs> on some of these things. But with that being said, um, let me um, let me dive right into um, Dossie's uh, quotes. And, and, and now, now she puts some of her own wording in surrounding his quotes, which and it does accurately reflect what he was saying. Um, so she says this um, in um, her uh, wife beating in manliness and antiquity. This is Dossie. When we compare the words of bishops from the fourth and early fifth centuries, the strongest expressions of disapproval are found in the East. This is disapproval of corporal discipline of, of, of wives. Okay. According to John Chrysostom, who was a priest of Antioch and later Bishop of Constantinople, it was the height of insult for a man to beat his wife. No fault of the wife could possibly justify it. It was disgraceful enough to raise a hand against a slave girl. How much more shameful was it for a man to beat a free woman? And this is a quote from John Chrysostom. Let there be no fault found such as to drive you to, to, to the necessity of beating your wife. And why do I say wife? It would not be bearable for a free man to beat and lay his hands even on a servant girl. And if there is such a disgrace in striking a slave, how much more in stretching your right hand against a free woman. So again here, and she'll talk about this too, this does reflect the Greek um, view, the Hellenistic view, that women were not to be physically disciplined. Now, there was some exceptions with female slaves, but especially free women, that was a big, big no-no in, in, in the Hellenistic world, okay? In, in, the, in the eastern side there over there, in that culture. Uh, that was a big, big, big no-no, okay? You did not... So the whole, like, never raise a hand to a woman, that's where it comes from, okay? So, I mean, it's, 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 it's old. It goes back to the Greeks, okay? They, they had a different thought on it. So, you know, some people could say, oh, yeah, yeah, I like what the Greeks said. Okay, all right. But the, the point is, is that but culturally doesn't match up because, you know, the Greeks did a lot of other things that were unbiblical. Homosexuality was nothing to them. Men having sex with men was nothing to them. Uh, women having sex with women uh, in many parts was nothing to them, especially the Spartans. Um, if you read on the Spartans, I mean, like they were almost like feminists with, I mean, not quite. I mean, I know the men were still heads, but, but I mean, they educated their women even further than the men most of the time, because the men only educated to a certain point and then they became warriors and spent all their time learning how to fight. Okay. Um, the women could address men in, in their assemblies. They, they, they could, they, you know, uh, they, they exercised and worked out and were really strong like the men, all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, but, but, but the thing is, is, is that there were a lot of things that, that the Greeks did with women or just sexually speaking that were, Oh, Oh, I meant to tell you the Spartans, um, literally they, the, the wives would sleep around and with their husband's knowledge with other men to breed the best soldiers. They'd be like, Oh, look at that guy, honey. He could make us a really strong son. Okay. You can go ahead and go have sex with them next Friday night. Okay. That's what they did. So we can't hold up the Greeks and go, well, the Greeks were noble and right and saying a man should never raise his hand to a woman okay they could be right if the bible backs that up but we can't just you know go by that but that does affect that's where john christendom gets you know his culture bringing that into the scriptures okay and his aversion um to 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 physical punishment in this way for women okay he's reading in the hellenistic view that a man should never raise his hands uh to a woman. And he says here um, that uh, in her book, uh, Dossie puts it in here, uh, he expected husbands to employ nonviolent means of discipline. So um, ag again, so he was kind of in between a complementarian because complementarians today would say absolutely none. But when you see his discipline, it really is what complementarians say. Um, <laughs> Uh, cause it's not really discipline cause he's just telling him he thinks they're wrong, but there's no consequences. Right. So it's not really discipline. Let me read this to you. But he expected husbands to employ nonviolent means of discipline, such as admonishing their wives verbally or sending them to bed without any dinner. Okay. The, the sending them to bed without dinner. Okay. There's some consequence there. Okay. Okay. So, so, so John Christendom is not, 
um, a pure complementarian. He 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 is a little bit into the biblical patriarch here. We'll we'll give him that credit. Okay, non-physical discipline like sending their wife to bed without dinner. Corporal punishment should not be used on any account. And then this is a quote for him, uh, from him. Let him exhort her. Let him admonish her as one who is less perfect. Let him persuade her with reasoning. Let him never lay his hands on her. These things are far from a free spirit, quote unquote, close quote. Um, so then Dossie continues, uh, men should remember they are the husbands. And she's saying that this is what he's saying in his writings. And it is true. Men should remember that they are the husbands, not the masters of their wives. The corporal discipline suitable for a slave will have the effect of destroying any quote unquote love and pleasure in marriage when applied to a wife. So I've seen some of these quotes before um, in other places from her, but what's really hard is to find some of the quotes that she gives from Augustine. Um, and it's, and it's almost as far as his approving um, sources that would show him approving of uh, corporal discipline of women. Um, and, and it's, and if I was a conspiracy guy, I would say that um, some people are blocking this information from getting out there because uh, the church doesn't want people seeing the, how much he was for the corporal discipline of wives. But I could be wrong on that. So, um, <laughs> but here is, this is not from uh, Dossie's book. Uh, this is from um, the scripturecatholic.com uh, uh, article, Husband is Ahead of the Family. Um, <laughs> so he just gives this quote from John Christendom. In his homily on Colossians, um, he says uh, that the wife is to be, uh, so it is that wives are to be, that is to be subject for God's sake. This is John Christendom. That is to be subject for God's sake um, because this is, oh, he says here, wives be subject to your husbands. That is be subject for God's sake because this adorns you, Paul says, not them. For I mean not the, the subjection which is due to a master, nor yet that which is alone is of nature, but that which is offered for God's sake. So John Christendom is trying to say the subjection of wives to their husbands is not the normal kind that a servant would give to their master. Okay? It's the one given for God's sake. So I mean not the subjection which is due to a master. So this is one of those places, and, and he says it in other places in his writings, but where he is in essence denying the lordship of the husband. He's saying the husband is the head of the wife, but but a wife doesn't have to submit to him like he's her master. Well, that's not true. First Peter 3, 5 to 6, read that. Yes, the Bible says she's to call him her lord. Yes, and it's all throughout the Old Testament. You just can't see it in English, but there's many times where husband is a translation in the Old Testament of the Hebrew for master, Baal. And even today, Orthodox, there's some really traditional Orthodox Jewish women that still call their husbands Baal. Okay, master, my master. Okay, that's what they mean. Okay, so John Christendom is absolutely wrong in this, that the subjection of a wife is not the same as the subjection which is due to a master. That is false. First Peter 3, 5 to 6 proves that utterly false. And the, and the, and the terminology for a husband being called master throughout the Old Testament in the Hebrew, which we don't see in the English translation, proves that. But First Peter um, three, five to six is a nail in that. It, it is a, it is a bomb. It is a devastation to this view and to the, and this is, this reflects complementarianism. Complementarianism today denies the Lord. It, it affirms the headship of the husband while denying the lordship of the husband. So it basically makes him a figurehead leader and guts him of any real power in the marriage. Okay. So, um, this is the problem with Christendom's, you know, Hellenistic, you know, view that he read into this, okay, um, when, in his opposition to men. Um, and, and this for him, this is why it made sense that a man cannot um, use corporal discipline. He's like, that's not acceptable even with female slaves. Only male slaves is it acceptable for, let alone your free woman, a wife, your your partner, okay? Um, uh, yeah, so you can see where he's coming from on that. So now... Um, I want to take you to a larger uh, reading, give you more context of to some quotes that um, Dossie gives um, from her study. <laughs> and this is from newadvent.org. And this is um, Chrysostom's um, homily 20 on Ephesians. Okay. <laughs> and he says this, husbands say he love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. So he's giving, 
um, his um, commentary on this. <laughs> he says, this is Chrysostom. Um, you have seen the measure of obedience. Hear also the measure of love. Would you have your wife obedient unto you as Christ is to the ch- is the churches to Christ? Take then yourself the same provident care for her, as Christ takes care for the church. Yea, even if it shall be needful for you to give your life for her, yea, and to be cut into pieces ten thousand times, yea, and to endure and undergo any suffering whatsoever, refuse it not. He continues, though you should undergo all of this, yet well you not, no, not even then, have done anything like Christ. And to everything he has just said so far, I would say, amen. He continues, for thou indeed art doing it for one to whom you are already knit. So you're already married to her. But he, for one who turned her back on him and hated him, he's talking about Christ. <clears throat> In the same way then, as he laid at his feet, her who turned her back on him, who hated and spurned and, dis- and disdained him, not by menaces, not nor by violence, nor by terror, nor by anything else of any kind, but by his unwearied affection. So also do thou behave toward your wife. <clears throat> now this is where it gets a little interesting. So Christentum uh, paints this picture of this woman, you know, turning her back, uh, 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 being, and, and she wasn't, they weren't married yet. They weren't knit together yet. Right. Um, uh, And this is similar to what I talked about previously, Um, the the, the picture um, in the the first um, podcast on this series of discipline here that we just did, um, is that the picture of Christ and the church with Ephesians 5 is that of a man finding a a woman who is not attractive, who is detestable, who could be ornery and mean and nasty toward him, okay, And, and him paying everything he could paying his very life to purchase her, right, as his wife, paying with his blood, okay? <laughs> um, so he's not wrong in that sense. Um, but it's where he but he talks about that, um, that he laid her back toward him, not by menaces or violence or terror, or not by terror or anything else kind, but by his unwearied affection. So in other words, he's trying to say that a man can only win his wife um, to obedience to him by his affection toward her. And that number one is wrong. Okay. So, but let's continue. Yea, though thou see her looking down upon you and disdaining and scorning you, yet by your great thoughtfulness for her, by affection, by kindness, you will be able to lay her at your feet. Again, affection, kindness. Okay. Even though your wife is disdaining, scorning you, <clears throat> just being all manner of nastiness, not submitting to you in any way, you can lay her at your feet by affection, by affection, by kindness, you will be able to lay her at your feet. And I'm, I'm going to come back to this. For there is nothing more powerful to sway than these bonds, especially for a husband and wife. A servant, indeed, one will be able, perhaps, to bind by fear. Nay, not even him, for he will soon start away and be gone. But the partner of one's life, that's the the word partner he uses for wife, but the partner of one's life, the mother of one's children, the foundation of one's every joy, one ought never to chain down by fears and menaces, but with love and good temper. And he continues, for what sort of union is that where the wife trembles at her husband? And what sort of pleasure will the husband himself enjoy if he dwells with his wife as with a slave and not with a free woman? Yea, though you should suffer anything on her account, do not upbraid her. Upbraid her is to rebuke her, scold her. For neither did Christ do this. He's wrong on that. Christ does rebuke and chasten his church. Neither let a wife say to her husband, unmanly coward. So now he's going back to the wife. Neither let the wife say to the husband, unmanly coward that you are, full of sluggishness and dullness and fast asleep. Here is such a one, a low man of low parentage. You have cowered down and livest to no purpose. So just telling him how bad he is. Let not the wife say these things, nor anything like them, for she is the body 
not to dictate to the head, but to the but to submit herself and obey. See again, he affirms the headship of the man, but he denies the lordship. Chrysostom denies the lordship. That's what you got to remember, not the headship. Neither, however, let the husband, when he hears these things, on the score of his having the supreme authority, so this is his reaction to the wife doing all this, betake himself to revelings and to blows. That's this is to physically disciplining her or even yelling at her. But let him exhort, let him admonish her as being less perfect. Let him persuade her with arguments. Let him never once lift his hand. Far be this from a noble spirit. No, nor give expression to insults or taunts or revelings, but let him regulate and direct her as being wanton in wisdom. Now, we need to go back over some of these things because, uh, again, I respect John Chrysostom, but he's absolutely wrong in this approach. Okay, it's it's and it, and and really he's he, he's going directly, you know, against the script. He's basically ignoring certain scripture passages that don't fit his narrative, his really his Greek cultural upbringing. Remember, in in Hellenistic culture, in Hellenistic Greek culture, okay, it was unbecoming for a man to physically discipline, corporally discipline a woman in any way, shape, or form, to raise his hand, to whip her, anything. That was unbecoming. So he's taking what he was raised with in his culture, and he is infusing it into the scriptures, sort of like people do today, um, infusing our egalitarian views and, and complementarians do it, infusing their complementarian ideas <laughs> that don't match up with biblical patriarchy into the Bible. John Chrysostom is doing that very thing here. So now let's go back and look at John Chrysostom's words and compare them with the scriptures. Okay, So if we go back and in the first um, paragraph that I read, um, he talks about um, the sufferings that Christ went through for his um, bride-to-be. She wasn't even his bride yet, bride-to-be, right? Okay. And and scripturally, I agree with him there that, that um, you know, the, the presentation from uh, Ephesians 5, uh, 25 to 27, is of that, that uh, of, a, uh, of a woman that is spotted and wrinkled and unholy and that the man comes along to make her into the glorious wife that he wants her to be. Okay. So I presented that. So I agree with him on that part but what he is confusing is pre cross christ the, 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 the before christ died on the cross to purchase his wife riddled with sin right that he describes here okay and then the way christ deals with her after his death if you look through the scriptures the apostles on behalf of christ paul especially talks about um their obedience and their uh, toward Christ and what he desires from them. And they, Paul even said in one passage, shall I come to you in love or with a rod on behalf of Christ? He says this, okay? So Christ, no, before he took her as wife, there, there was no demand of obedience. After he absolutely demands the obedience of his churches, okay? Through his apostles. So um, Chrysostom is, is missing this aspect. The post-resurrected Christ, who has now purchased his bride, treats her differently than he did before he had purchased her. The post-resurrected Christ does not simply allow his wife to do all of these terrible things toward him. He doesn't take all these revelings and these insults and these betrayals. No, he does not. Read Revelation. Read some of the epistles. No, he does not. He rebukes his churches. And in Revelation 3.19, he says, Those who I, whom I love to my churches, I rebuke and I chasten. Okay? So this is what Chrysostom is missing. Okay? Is that the post-resurrected Christ deals with his church differently than before he died on the cross. Before he purchased the church with his blood. So he is confusing apples and oranges okay so a man already being knit together with his wife that that would be like the post resurrected christ he doesn't go oh no 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 no! christ took all this no no christ took the insults and the beatings and everything before he died to purchase his wife not after 
after that, he cleans her, he washes her, he rebukes her, he chastens her, okay? And this is something that is utterly ignored in Chrysostom's writings, okay? Um, and, and But this is actually, this, this is the kind of thing that's taught by complementarian preachers today, that men can do nothing toward their, their, their belligerent, disrespectful, unsubmissive wives. All they can do is, I mean, literally, this could be taken out of a complementarian book today on marriage. All you can do is win her with your affection and your kindness. And by that, you will bring her to lay at your feet. No, no, folks, that's not how Christ deals with his church. And that is not how you bring a woman. Now, now, I'm not saying that men can't be kind to their wives and be gracious, even in the face of sometimes her doing some wrong things. That's graciousness, mercy, compassion. Yes, and, and, I, and, and I believe that's in the scriptures. That's all over the place. That God is merciful, full of compassion and grace, right? So we absolutely, as husbands, should show grace, mercy, and compassion toward our wives. But we should also discipline them. Grace, mercy, and compassion do not negate the need for discipline. It's just they must be balanced. Those things must be balanced. If you think of it on a scale, it's in a marriage, you're constantly trying to balance on one side, showing her grace, mercy, and compassion, and on the other side, giving her the discipline that is your right to do and your duty toward her to do. A husband who is not, its this is a true statement, listen to me when I say this, a husband who never shows his wife grace, mercy, or compassion is not loving her as Christ loves the church. And a husband who never disciplines his wife is not loving his wife as Christ loves the church. Those two things are not at odds. Those two things are both equally true. And this is what <clears throat> Chrysostom is missing here. He's missing this truth and because he's blinded by his Hellenistic Greek cultural views that a woman is never, a man is never to raise his hand to a woman. And, and really, we're living in that same age today. Is a, a man is never to raise his hand to a woman. We're, we're, we, uh, most people listening to me would agree with Chrysostom here. OK, despite the scriptures and, and all the things on physical discipline that I gave in, in, in the first podcast on this, uh, the biblical case for domestic discipline, um, uh, y you you feel like this is right. But this is cultural, just like it was for him. He was going with his cultural views of, of the a man should never raise a hand to a woman. So, too, that's the way most people are today. This is describing our culture and complementarianism. They, they, like I said, what he wrote here, Chrysostom, John Chrysostom wrote here. Uh, 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 you could read this in a complementarian book today, okay? You cannot, according to complementarians, your headship is not allowed to be enforced. You cannot force your wife in any way through physical or non-physical means. See, see, Chrysostom would be a little different than complementarians, like I said earlier, because he does allow for, like, sending the wife to the room without dinner or something like that. Um, or today, complementarians totally remove any ability to do anything. Um, but he is much closer with complementarians, though, in, in denying the mastery of the, the lordship of the husband. He affirms the headship like complementarians do, but he denies the lordship. So he he continues here, <coughs> um, and in this section here, like where he says, but the partner of one's life. The Bible never calls the wife the partner of the husband. It calls her the companion in the Old Testament. Companion. That's not partner. Companion. Okay. All right. But the Bible consistently is that the wife teaches that the wife is to be in subjection to her husband. She is his subordinate. She is not his partner. And then he talks about, you know, for what what sort of union is it where the wife trembles at her husband? And what sort of pleasure will the husband enjoy if he dwells with his wife as with a slave? Um, and that was with a free woman. And, and right there, he again is denying that phrase, he's denying the mastery of the husband, okay? She's a free woman. You are not her master. She's a free woman. That's what he is saying. Um, and then he says, yea, though you should suffer anything on whatever she does, calls you every single name in the book, rebels against you, calls you this horrible man, you should do nothing. You, you should not upbraid her a parade meeting, shouldn't scorn or rebuke her at all. For neither did Christ do this. Wrong. Christ did do this. Revelation 3.19, John Chrysostom. Revelation 3.19. Those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And he said that. Jesus Christ said that to his churches. And he also rebuked them through the Apostle Paul several times in the epistles. 
Okay? So that is untrue. That is absolutely untrue. So let me take you when he says here that what sort of uh, union is where the wife trembles at the husband. First Peter 3. I'll tell you what sort of union that is. It's a biblical union. Okay? First Peter 3. Likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands. Subjection. Not partnership with your husband. Subjection to your own husband. That if any obey not the word, they also may be one. They also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Conversation doesn't mean like having a conversation. It's old English for behavior. Um, the behavior of the wives was saying, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Coupled with fear. God commands wives to fear their husbands. Even in Ephesians 5.33, where it says to uh, that the wife is to reverence her husband. That word reverence is from a synonym for this. It also means fear. Okay? Wives are to fear their husbands in a reverent way. It's it, it's not like a scared of a monster, but it is. But part of that fear, and I, and I have done other podcasts on this. You can listen about this. Um, uh, that, that part of that fear is a fear of, I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to be punished by him because I disappointed him. I don't want to be punished because I disobeyed him or disrespected him. Okay. But so when he, when John Chrysostom says for what sort of union is that where the wife trembles at her husband, that's a biblical union. First Peter three, two. So he is absolutely wrong. And then when he talks about for the, for he who dwells with his wife as a slave, uh, if he dwells with his wife as a slave and not as a free woman, what kind of joy is there in that? Um, there's a lot of joy. Did Abraham have joy with his wife? First Peter 3, 5 to 6. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorn themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Curios in the Greek. Okay. Same word used for kings, same word used for God. Okay. Now we're not saying men are God. But men represent God, okay, in marriage and in this world. That's why we have patriarchy. That's why God ordained patriarchy. Men are over women in this world. It's a, it's a higher rank, okay? It doesn't mean that men as human beings are more valuable, but they have a higher rank than women. That's why the Bible says God is king of kings and lord of lords. Guess why? Because he's the highest king over all the kings of the earth, and he's lord of lords. So capital L, lord of the little lords. Guess who the little lords are? Okay, the nobles, husbands, masters of slaves. He is the Lord of Lords. But there, but God being the Lord of Lords means there's Lords underneath him. So we cannot deny that. Um, I had a woman at church uh, the other day. Uh, the, I told her about First Peter 6. It says, you know, it says, you're, even as Sarah called her husband Lord. Oh, I don't believe it. Uh, 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 she wouldn't even look at the passage. She, 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 she's just like, I only have one Lord, and he is Jesus Christ. I'm like, it, do you not realize the Bible says he's Lord of Lords? So who are the other Lords? There's only one. No, 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 no. There, there's, there's, there's the Lord, which is God, Jesus Christ, the Trinity, that, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The, yes, that's the, the Lord. Agreed. But there are little Lords. There are lesser Lords underneath him. And it's the height of ignorance that we have today. That people do not understand that. It is not a contradiction for a wife to call her husband Lord, but then also worship her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Lord. Okay? Her husband is a Lord. He is her earthly Lord. But there is the Lord up in heaven, Jesus Christ. Okay? God the Father, the Trinity. Right? Okay? These things are not contradictory. These things all flow together. Um, but it's, it's just, <laughs> it's sad um, that uh, Chrysostom and even today, and, and, and his thoughts, this debate continued throughout history between the, the uh, Eastern Church and the Western Church about the discipline of the woman. Because in, in Western, in, in Europe, you know, um, they didn't put up with the kind of things that he's saying, okay, from women. They, did, they were like, no, 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 that's not going to happen in our house, no. God has established the husbands, and that's what we're going to get into next. Augustine's view. So Western, the Western Church's view 
um, which the Protestant church took on. The Protestant church pretty much took on, I mean, with some exceptions here and there, the Protestant church <laughs> took on the view um, uh, of the Western church and of Augustine on this issue of um, wife discipline. So let's just jump into it. So now I've explained to you John Chrysostom's position, and I have debunked it from a biblical perspective. Now we're going to look at Augustine's position. Okay. So uh, Dossie in her book, um, and this again is from uh, Wife Beating in Antiquity and Ma Wife Beating and Manliness in Antiquity, I believe it is. Um, <laughs> and so she quotes this: Augustine considered corporal discipline when motivated by the desire for correction to be a sign of affection. In his treatise on fasting, he compared the need to make the body the, to the, the make the body obey the spirit through fasting to a husband's loving discipline of his wife. Therefore, he said this, this is Augustine. Therefore, do we hate those whom we desire to obey us? Each man in his own house often gives discipline to his wife and subdues her when she resists him. He doesn't persecute, persecute her as an enemy. So he's saying, hey, when a husband disciplines his wife, and he means physical discipline, trust me, as we read on some other places, he means physical discipline. When he gives discipline to his wife, when he subdues her, that's physical. He subdues her, that's physical, okay? As, as she resists, or when she resists him, he subdues her when she resists him, okay? He's saying, he doesn't, he's not doing this persecuting her as an enemy. He's doing this out of love. And this is the love of Christ. For his church. So Augustine in this area, again, I, I don't agree with Chrysostom and everything. And I don't agree with Augustine. I, I've, I've done po podcasts or, or I've written articles and I believe I've done some podcasts mentioning Augustine um, uh, uh, that I don't agree with him on his view of sex. You know, he had a very negative view of sex. So um, now when it comes to authority and marriage and everything, he was pretty close to right <laughs> and discipline and marriage and the need for that. He was right. Um, but he, he's absolutely right. That, that that it's not hatred of a husband if he's doing it under the right. Now, can some husbands do it for the wrong reasons and hateful and being nasty and, and, and disciplined in the wrong way? Yes, but it can be done in a right way. That is that is Augustine's um, point. So um, Dossie continues. She, she says, um, and, and she's saying this on behalf of what Augustine is saying. She's summarizing what he's saying. It would be a sign of indifference not to correct a loved one for sinning in Augustine's view. If you see your wife going to the theater or even worse, getting drunk at the holy places, it is your duty. And she's um, uh, like paraphrasing what he's saying in these letters. Um, if you see your wife getting drunk or doing things wrong, it is your duty to stop her to the best of your ability. I have said that very thing for years. OK, um, and I didn't find Augustine's writings on this until I came to the position scripturally. And I was like, this makes sense. And I found Augustine and went, oh, yeah, he's saying the same thing I am. OK, fine. Um, I've said to men, um, yes, at a certain point, are there some women that will resist all manner of discipline, physical, non-physical, everything, and, and, and you've done everything you can do within your ability, and, and they're still not going to obey, they're still going to disobey you, they're still going to disobey God? Yes, that's going to happen. And if you can say honestly before God, Lord, I have done everything I can with this woman, and she still won't submit, she won't do the right things, okay? God knows that, okay? Then, then we've done, all we can do is what we can humanly, what we're able to do. And, and sometimes we're restricted by physical abilities. Sometimes we're restricted by, you know, our, our culture, our legal system, you know, what she believes about marriage and discipline, that kind of stuff. So, so I mean, there's all kinds of things that come into play here. But um, but what, what uh, he, he's talking about here is the best of your ability. It's your duty to stop her to the best of your ability. And then here's a quote from him. Is it your friend? Let him be gently admonished. Now, this is listen to this, what Augustine said. This is a direct quote. Is it your friend? Let him be gently admonished. Is it your wife? Let her be curbed severely. <laughs> That's not gentle. That's not Chrysostom's affection and kindness. Remember what he said? Do it only with affection and kindness. No, he said, let her be curbed severely. Okay. He's talking about physical punishment, corporal punishment. Is it your slave girl? Augustine continues. Let her be restrained with floggings. Okay. Um, so she says here, we see in this last example that Augustine does, does distinguish between the discipline of a slave girl and a wife, but both should 
the occasion warranted, were subject to corporal punishment. You see that? They're both subject to corporal punishment. The most public example, and this is Dossie continuing, um, <coughs> the most public example of this husbandly correction comes from one of Augustine's new letters in which Augustine advised a fellow bishop on how to settle a family dispute. A mother-in-law had sold her daughter's daughter-in-law's bride gift out of anger over some insult. So she sold the daughter's bride gift. She wasn't supposed to do that. This sort of mother and daughter-in-law friction is common in, the, in our sources, using things that she saw from back then, and often led to violence against wives. Um, what added to the insult in this case is that the husband appears to have taken his wife's part. The family was Jewish, but Augustine nevertheless considered a Christian bishop a suitable person to arbitrate. So here he is, a Christian bishop, is arbitrating over a Jewish family's dispute. <clears throat> if the bishop found the husband to be at fault, he should flog him in the presence of his mother. If the wife was at fault, she can receive, quote-unquote, she can receive the fitting discipline of flogging from her husband. This is Augustine, quote-unquote. She can receive the fitting discipline of flogging from her husband in the presence of her mother-in-law with your veneration acting as judge. The slave girl could be dealt with by the mother-in-law herself. Augustine's conception of hierarchy, this is Dossi continuing, Augustine's conception of hierarchy is very clear in this letter. The free man could be beaten by a judge, the wife by her husband, and the slave girl by any free adult of the family. The public, or at least semi-public nature, of the wife's punishment is striking. So you understand, that's why people try and act like, oh, yeah, Augustine, because I'm going to read this, this letter about his mother. Well, he wasn't specifically saying in this letter that he approved of his, you know, of, of men, you know, beating their wives. But, you, you know, we can't derive that from this letter. Well, you can't maybe derive that directly from that letter, but you could derive it from these other letters and these other times that he spoke on this, okay? So, I mean, he literally said about a wife, she can receive the fitting discipline of flogging from her husband. And then it was even public. It wasn't just the husband doing it in private. It's in the presence of her mother-in-law with the judge witnessing. A woman publicly being flogged by her husband in the presence of other family members who she committed acts against, okay? And a judge watching it. I've talked about that too. I've had people over the years ask me, do you think that it's it's shameful or wrong for a man to spank his wife in front of others? And I have said, I can't say that it is. I can't see why it would be. Um, you know, sometimes public discipline, whether it's of children or of wife, is necessary. Um, it depends on the act. Like, I mean, if, if she's mouthing off and being disrespectful to her husband in front of a bunch of people, is it right for him to take her over his knee right in front of them? Does he, this is what happens. You shamed me in front of them. So guess what? I'm going to discipline you in front of them. <clears throat> and you could see this, like there's old movies where they show this John Wayne movies and other ones where, where, where women getting spanked in front of a crowd of people for, for being disrespectful and ornery and nasty. Okay. So this is not outside the norm. Okay. Um, uh, again, this whole thing of like a woman shouldn't be, sp Oh, that shames her, treats her like a child, dishonors her. Okay. That's that's all bringing in the, the Hellenistic Greek view, okay? It's not a biblical view. It's a Hellenistic Greek view of how women are to be treated, and it's, and it's bubbled up its way through all these centuries into modern-day complementarianism, okay? And so this is one of those things where I used to think this way, folks. I used to think like Chris has done, okay, like the first way. I used to think it was shameful for a man to ever raise his hand to a woman, okay? And then I realized I was wrong. I realized I had my cultural blinders on. And um, just FYI for you uh, historians or history buffs or Augustine fans, um, the, the, the new letters of Augustine, uh, this, where this comes from, one of, uh, one of those letters that it comes from, um, uh, where Augustine said she can receive the fitting discipline of flogging from her husband in the presence of her mother-in-law with the veneration acting as judge. Um, that came from a collection of, of 29 letters that were discovered in 1969 by uh, Johann uh, Divijak, Divijak, I think it is how you pronounce that, but those were discovered in 1969. So 
uh, then they've been uh, and they've been verified and, and the same writing style and uh, everything, you know, looks legit on those. <laughs> um, but it's but it's interesting um, uh, how those have given us a insight into the family culture and just the day to day things that he was dealing with. Um, uh, very fascinating, really, um, in many ways. So um, there's another uh, uh, part where Dossie goes into um, the part about his mother. Now, this is more famously known, this statement. And people will say, well, he, he, he doesn't specifically endorse a, a, a wife spanking here. So here's the quote. And some of you may recognize it if you know this. Uh, many women, this is Augustine talking about his mother. Okay, Many women whose husbands were far more gentle than her own bore the disfiguring marks of blows even on their faces. And so when they used to meet together and complain of the lifestyle of their husbands, my mother would admonish their gossiping tongues with a light manner. But in all seriousness, she told them that ever since they had heard the marriage deed read over them, so ever since they got married, that day they got married, they ought to have regarded it as a contract which bound them to serve their husbands. And from that time onwards, mindful of their conditions, they should not defy their masters. So his mom and, 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 and it regarded the woman's husband as the master. Remember, John Chrysostom denied the lordship, the mastery of the husband over the wife, where his mother affirmed it, to, not only for herself, but for other women in the area. Your husband is not just your head, ladies. Your husband is your master. And when you married him, you, you, you took on a contract to serve that man as your, as your master for the rest of your life. And you need to be mindful of that and everything that you say and do. Okay. Now, of course, you know, modern readers will say, uh, well, well, yeah, he's talking about women that got abused by other men and his, his mom tippy toed around and didn't get abused. But, but he wasn't saying that his father would have been right for doing that. Well, okay. He doesn't say so much that here, but um he does say that elsewhere okay so so the thing is is he, we just read to you from the letters where he talked about a, a, it is the a it is fitting discipline um for a husband to flog his wife okay he said that okay so unless you want to you know d dismiss the, the new letters and, and other places too where he alludes to this stuff but the thing is is that um we, we know based on the you know now again uh in roman culture it was normal for a man to corporally discipline his wife. Okay. That was the norm. Now <laughs> we have to come back to this whole culture versus the Bible thing. Um, it just so happened in this case that the cultural, uh, the Roman cultural view of the man being the master of the house and the master of his wife and the man, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, being able to exercise corporate discipline with his wife does line up with the scriptures okay the more tra patriarchal roman view did line up with the scriptures where um the hellenistic partnership you know view uh, you know don't you know you you don't ever raise your hand to her you know woman at all that didn't line up with the bible okay there was no such no such prohibition in the scriptures okay so in this case yeah somebody said well larry well his cultural views led him to you know well y yes it, he had the views coming into this but the scriptures actually support it. He didn't have to read into First Peter three, uh, wives uh, 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 regard your husband as your master. You know, follow the the the, the, the example of Sarah who called her husband Lord. Uh, Augustine didn't have to read that into the scriptures. It's right there. It's plain as day. It, and it doesn't. He didn't have to read into the scriptures. Wives fear your husbands. It's right there. First Peter three two. Okay, and also uh, Ephesians five thirty three. Okay, so that is in the scriptures. Okay. Um, so it so happens that the, that the, the Western cultural, um, values and practices in regard to the discipline of wives more closely aligned with the scriptures than the Eastern rejection, um, of any, um, discipline, well, well, physical discipline, because it's a lot, a, a small amount of, of non-physical discipline, but pretty much he told men, as I read to you, He's got to take it. He's got to take it and just repay her with affection and kindness. I mean, it sounds just like complimentary preachers today, just like it. I mean, it, you could lift it right out of their books today. Um, <clears throat> but uh, my point here is, is that you could see these two 
as as is very different. And I want to continue here um, with uh, Dossie with her commentary, uh, the last part here on Augustine. So this is Dossie saying this. Augustine is part of a wider Latin patriotic or you know patriotic patriarchal tradition that considered the discipline of wives to be ordained by God. Um, according to Lact Lactantius, I'm not saying that right. According to Lactantius, the North African tutor of Constantine's son. Okay, big next to big guy name dropping there. <clears throat> so Emperor Constantine. So the tutor of Constantine's son, Constantine converted to Christianity, of course. Um, God gave men more physical strength than women, so that men could more easily compel women to endure the marital yoke. Um, so in, in other words, one of the reasons that God made women men stronger so that they could exercise control over their women. Because to, to rule over the woman, as Genesis 3.16 requires, requires mastery, requires the ability to subdue. The man must have the power to subdue. So the average man can subdue the average woman. Okay, that's the point. Um, Am, Ambrosteer, a Christian living in Rome in the late 4th century, so this considered husbands uh, the masters of their wives by natural law, because women had been created out of Adam's rib. Uh, to quote him, women are ordered to be subject to men by natural law because man is the octor of woman. So they ought to be subject to men just like a master. He referred approvingly more than once to the Bible verse where Sarah called Abraham her master, which I've just read to you, um, 1 Peter um, 3, uh, 5 and 6 there. So they're basing their views of, of the lordship of the husband the husband is not just the head of his wife, he's the lord of his wife as well. And 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 by his being the lord of her, he has the right and responsibility to discipline her, to compel her to the best of his ability to bring her into compliance with his God-ordained rule. As long as he's not asking her to sin, he has every right and responsibility to bring her into conformance to God's will for her life. So, um that'll cover it for this podcast that I just wanted to um, compare uh, the Eastern church's view, which is well represented uh, by John Chrysostom um, with the Western church's view, which the Protestants eventually took on um, <coughs> uh, of uh, uh, that wife discipline, that corporal punishment um, was not only acceptable, but necessary for a well-ordered society, well-ordered families um, that this was absolutely um, necessary. And so this debate, you know, has really been going on for thousands of years. Okay. Um, this is not something new. The idea of a man, uh, should never raise his hand to a woman is, is, is there's, there's been a segment of civilization that, that believes that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, the point being is, is that the Western church's view actually does their, their, their cultural value views, even though they predate Christianity, um, did, actually align with biblical principles of the husband being the master and thus the master having the power um, of discipline um, over his wife, the, the, the power, the right and responsibility um, to do that. So um, this is a big part of history here. And I, and I hope that, uh, that, that this has helped you a little bit along the ways. If this is the first time that you've heard of domestic discipline um, court and the concept of corporal punishment for wives, or even just, even non-physical discipline that husbands disciplining their wives by, you know, sending them to the room without food or, or, or for, for the night, for dinner, for the night, or, 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 you know, grounding them in the house. You can't go out with your friends or can't talk to your friends on the phone or, you know, non-physical things like that or taking away spending money or canceling date nights or a host of other uh, non-physical things that I've talked about. Um, and, and by the way, I do have a, uh, a, a whole podcast where I talk about, um, it's from a little while back, but, um, where I talk about seven ways that a husband can discipline his wife, and they're all non-physical. So it's, a, it's, it's like basically, here's a non-physical ways that a husband can discipline his wife. So you might want to go back and, you know, check that podcast out. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I hope that this has been um, enlightening for you and seeing this, this, this totally different viewpoints of the Western church versus the Eastern church on this uh, issue um, of, of the corporal discipline of women. And, and, I, and I have shown it in the first podcast uh, on, on a biblical case uh, for domestic discipline, that the Western church's view, although it did fit with their culture as well, um, it was biblical. Where the Eastern church's view, their their cultural view, 
um, that they tried to impose upon the Bible was not um, was not biblical because they were he, he was comparing Christ's sufferings before he took on his bride before he purchased his bride not what how did he treat her after the post resurrected Christ how did he treat his wife did he demand her obedience yes did he chasten her through his apostles yes did he uh, talk about chastening her himself in the book of Revelation yes so so he he glosses over that he he glosses over First Peter three calling husbands masters of their wives so so it's a complete um, swing and a miss on his part you know just inf infusing his cultural views um, trying to into the Bible unfortunately the same way that complementarians and egalitarians do today infusing their views um, trying to impose those into the scriptures when they really don't match so um, thanks for listening and um, come back for the next part in this series. Um, I'm going to cover uh, some more people centuries um, after Augustine and um, John Chrysostom and, uh, you know, just take you through the Middle Ages and, and uh, we'll see how far we get. Maybe even I mean, if we even get all the way up to the 19th century. So we'll see how much I can get into the next podcast. But come back for the next one. We're going to go through some more history um, the, on the, the, the history of, uh, of domestic discipline. Thanks for listening.